I'm really delighted to be here and actually quite astonished because I don't think even in Finsbury Park where I live on a cold Saturday afternoon I would gather such a crowd together as we have today. It's very impressive indeed. So uh, congratulations everybody and all that. I've got about 15 minutes I think to say something useful um, before you haul me off. But, but anyway, what I want to say is this that we are at, I think, quite um, a critical time um, of, of opportunity ahead of us. I come from a little church in North London, and it happens that the local MP, who's far from being a member of the congregation, but is a very devoted attendee for anything we're doing, and couldn't be more helpful with refugees, asylum seekers, housing, God knows what else, is someone you've heard of, in other words, Jeremy Corbyn. And never in all my life did I expect that Jeremy Corbyn would become leader of the Labour Party. It wasn't on the cards. He spent his time revolting against the Labour Party in Parliament or doing whatever you do by way of obstruction. And now he's leader of the Labour Party and saying so many sensible things. And the other day he caused a sensation when uh, they asked him about nuclear weapons and all that. And he said he wouldn't press the button. Shock horror. <laughs> A man who wouldn't press the button. He wouldn't kill a quarter of a million people by pressing the button. He wouldn't pollute the planet by pressing the button. And suddenly people began to say, maybe he's talking some sense. He is an extremely popular leader locally because he's been a consistent and faithful member of parliament. And he's never been greedy. In fact, um, I don't think he even owns the car. He always turns up on a rather broken uh, pedal bicycle wearing a black berry or something. That was so whether you'll do that in Downing Street, I don't know. But um, uh, I, I certainly am inspired. And I'm inspired also by someone internationally whom I've got a particular loyalty to, and that is Pope Francis. I think it's extraordinary what Pope Francis has done in the short time that he's been around. I thought that first trip out of Rome, down to Lampedusa, where the refugees were, was the most symbolic and beautiful thing he could have done. He said, you all my brothers and sisters. Credible. Well, I'm not here to give a long eulogy of Corbyn and, uh, and the Pope, uh, probably not, not appropriate in Wales, but I'd like to give you a few little reminders of how we got to where we are and what the possibilities are. How did we get to where we are? We got to where we are because largely because of one man, and uh, I have to say, I'm sure he was a good chap and all that, Ernest Bevin was, given, was called into the American Embassy I think in 1947, to be given a good rollicking because of the uh, spies who'd got into the British atomic establishment. And the ambassador told him over lunch that we will give you no more secrets in Britain, you're an unreliable ally, blah, 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 blah. That afternoon, Attlee had a meeting in, in uh, 10 Downing Street with a number of top scientists and civil servants and the drift, as Attlee had made clear from the beginning, was that we would not get nuclear weapons. We wouldn't waste our time getting nuclear weapons. But Bevin comes into this meeting late, full of indignation, and probably with a drop of alcohol or two, because he had lunch with the ambassador, and when he heard the way the conversation was going, he banged the table, and he said, as far as I'm concerned, we're going to have this thing over here as soon as possible, and we're going to have a bloody great Union Jack on top of it. And that is actually the spirit which has dominated the whole British nuclear weapon program ever since. A bloody great Union Jack on top of it. It's not a security issue, it's an issue of national importance, or allegedly national importance, that's all it is. And now we've come to the point where the balloon is about to be pricked, and uh, the, all these illusions of the past 
are coming to an end. I'm not going to take you all the way through the whole nuclear program we've had here. There have been some very opportune minutes, actually, during the Cuba crisis. Macmillan, Macmillan offered to get rid of the things if it would help to bring the, the Soviets to the table or whatever. Uh, but we've, we've come as we are all the way through, and it's become a kind of religious dogma, unchallengeable, that these things are our last, our ultimate security. I think they're our ultimate insecurity, but it's become a kind of 10th or 11th or 12th commandment that we don't have nuclear weapons, you're not safe. Well, there's only nine countries in the world out of 195 who are 196 who've got nuclear weapons, so presumably the others are, knees are all knocking all the time. But how, do they suppose, how are they supposed to actually defend us? What do, we, what do we do with them? They're meant to be strike terror into the hearts of anybody uh, because of our power of retaliation. What do you do with a group who aren't interested in retaliation, who want to get to heaven as quickly as possible? Um, uh, if you're dealing with an ISIS, for whom paradise is a target, you can't really threaten them. What do you do with a, with a group that hasn't got a territory? You can't threaten to blast their territory when they haven't got a territory. Uh, what do you do with people who are sane enough to know that any discharge of nuclear weapons would pollute the planet? So, so they're not going to be so mad as to... So you can't deter sane people because sane people wouldn't be thinking of threatening you. So who can you deter? Well, nobody really. It's pointless. The whole thing is a, a game. And if they're good for us, they should be good for everybody. Now we've come to a really good moment, I think, politically, of getting a serious interest going. I took a group over to Paris um, at the end of... Well, they took me, actually, um, 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 uh, a few weeks ago, at the end of the Paris talks. And I was actually quite disappointed because, even though there was a lot of hoo-ha in the press about the whole thing uh, going on, the great missing factor was the militarization of our planet. That was what was missing. Um, we spend now as a planet, as a globe, nearly two trillion dollars, two hundred trillion dollars a year on, on nuclear, on, uh, on weapons generally. That's the price of war. Trillions, not billions. Um, uh, to make all the machinery, whether they're nuclear weapons or whether, whether they're tanks or machine guns, colossal output of CO2, enormous amount of energy. The link between militarism and global climate change is like that, it's absolutely linked together. But it's got itself ignored, partly because of our own British charity laws. Um, because I'm sorry if I'm treading on any corns here now, but it's quite clear to me that many of the major charities in this country, charities with inverted commas, major charities, don't want to look at the military aspect of what is happening to our planet. They are quite happy to talk about poverty or climate change or whatever, um, or food supplies and so on, but militarism touches buttons all around the world that are too sensitive for charities. So they hide themselves behind the charity law and say, no, we, we can't touch this. And in Paris, very little was said about the, uh, about the effect on the climate of what we're doing with the world. Not only making wars more possible, but actually um, uh, the, the results of climate change causing wars as people flee in refugees. Heavens above, aren't we seeing it? Lampedusa is only one place, but all over the world people are fleeing. Islands in the Pacific uh, sinking out of sight because of what the, the, the tide rising and so on. And this is not a separate issue. It's an issue like that with militarism. And that's what we've got to get over. That what we've been asked to do is to spend a hundred and, it may be a hundred and fifty billion, God knows. I think that when they started the original Trident program, when I remember the campaign about 1980, it was going to cost five billion hours, British ones, it ended up costing about 15 billion. So when today people tell you it's going to cost 100 billion or 150 billion, I say yes, quite, and bring out a rabbit's foot and hope for the best, because it could be 300 billion by the time you're finished. All of the sort of, the sort of money that actually would make decent, civilized living possible in this world. And we, could, we don't have to have a housing crisis, we don't have to have a transport crisis or a pension crisis or whatever, if we could actually say no to this and start spending sensibly and telling other countries the same. We would be the first um, of the nuclear established powers to, to give up the game. We would be the first. 
be an incredible example. We have actually had other countries, uh, South Africa was mentioned, but some of the, the, uh, the states of the Soviet Union, when it broke up, had nuclear weapons and voluntarily got rid of them, gave them back to the Soviet Union. So we wouldn't quite be the first, but what an example we, were, we would be giving if we started an example like that. To say it's stupid, and it is stupid, uh, to continue as we are. The list of, I've read a book the other day, and I recommend it, I often read books, um, uh, and this one is about nuclear accidents. It's just come out from the States. I couldn't believe it. The number of times we have nearly had nuclear catastrophe because of a simple misunderstanding or an accident. In the Cuba crisis, the Soviet submarine was on the seabed, the American aircraft carrier was above, they'd already done a deal, Khrushchev and Kennedy, it was all over. But the submarine didn't know because they had no communication. And the captain of the submarine said, three of them were there, 40% of the crew had fainted because of the heat. Um, uh, uh, the captain said, for the honor of the Soviet Union, we will fire our nuclear torpedoes at that aircraft carrier. His number two said, that's right, so I don't mind, it's suicidal, but it's, we do it for the honor of our country. Number three said, we might be starting World War nuclear war if we do this. And so number three, who had the key, won the argument, and uh, it didn't happen. But the other one that really strikes me as, as fearsome, 1983, when, when Reagan was busy saying the Soviet Union was an evil empire, it was this, it was that, so the tension was colossal, we were going to have a great exercise in West Germany, moving everything about, including nuclear weapons, um, and, uh, and the, a, man, a man called... Um, oh, God, I've forgotten his name now, but it'll come back to me. In charge of the, of the nuclear obse observation bunker, he saw in the sky five missiles coming from the west to the east. And his duty was to tell them in Moscow, where old Andropov was sitting, about 95 years old. I don't know, I mustn't be ageous, having got where I am at the moment, I'm sorry. I'm not quite 95, but anyway, Andropov was there and had, um, had the... the uh, had the man in charge of the bunker told them in Moscow, I think it highly likely that Andropov would have said, well, far five back again. But he wouldn't make that decision. So I, these are the kind of examples that, are, that people don't know enough about. It's not a kind of, uh, I've got my nuclear weapons, you've got your nuclear weapons, everything's safe. It's absolutely unsafe permanently. And the more we have nuclear weapons, the more dangerous it becomes. We've got to learn to live together. And to do that, and to do that, we have actually to revitalize the whole spirit behind the formation of the, of the, of the, of the United Nations. It's become a, it's, in lots of ways, it's a, it's a drag. People don't know about it. I've been into three secondary schools recently and asked if anybody had ever seen the charter of the United Nations. And uh, I think two kids in one school put their hand up. The only ones ever seen it, not even part of the curriculum. The ignorance of the United Nations and what it was. Well. And yet the first point of the UN was to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. That's the preamble to the charter of the United Nations. And so we shouldn't be just against tribe replacement. Of course we should be. But we should be for social justice, international structures that work, and living as a community of people, what are we now, 8 billion, in a community of people who don't go around killing each other. I come from a little tiny street in North London, Venetia Road, which reminds me, by the way, if anybody does want to come to that demonstration uh, and uh, can afford the rail fare, and I don't mean to take, the, take any thunder away from yours up here, which is excellent, but I can certainly find them somewhere to stay in London for free, um, if you want to. Uh, with a bed, I mean, as well, not just on the floor. Um, uh, so it's possible. So I think that the, the, um, the, the possibilities are in front of us of changing things. And I think, actually, I'm not, Corbyn may win, he may not win, but the kind of spirit that's been created in the Corbyn world is not going to go away. And I think we are very important people in keeping it going and changing things for the better. So thank you very much for the invitation this afternoon, and I've now got to stop because I've done my time 14 and a half minutes, quite long enough. Thank you, God bless you.
said that he would not be voting against Trident because so many of his members had jobs in the nuclear industry. Now, how do you counter that argument? How do I counter the argument? Uh, well, to be, to be kind of ridiculous, I'd say uh, whatever it costs you to build Trident, you might just as well um, uh, give out to the workers in the same way and ask them to learn French and play golf. It would do nothing more or less for our economy than, th than that. It's a fictional job. It's not a job that benefits human, the human race. It's a fast job. So, but you say that, of course, they get quite cross. But it, that's actually what the reality of the matter. But the idea that you can't divert. We, at the end of the Second World War, something like two million people in this country working on armaments were redeployed into civilian production over two and a half years. It's perfectly possible for people who can make Trident submarines to make hospital ships. There's no, there's no snag between the two if the will was there. And I think we'd do more for peace in this world if we built 12 hospital ships than building four more Trident submarines. Yeah. But actually, if you were talking to someone building Auschwitz, you wouldn't say, excuse me, but I can get you a job somewhere that isn't building Auschwitz. You'd say building something that is wicked is not something that I think you should be doing at all. And, uh, and I think we should come out stronger with a moral argument. I'm always so sad that the moral aspect is never, oh, well, never mentioned by those supporting it, and probably not strongly enough by those against it. I think one of the biggest challenges that, that um, any of us on the left or uh, on the side of disarmament have is that people have different moral compasses and some of the, the, the proponents of nuclear weapons will think that it is a moral question to protect our country above other countries <coughs> and that filters down to being it's a moral issue to have more material wealth for me and my family compared to other families. It's, it's like Thatcher said, there is no such thing as society, there are only individuals and their families. It trashes the planet. Arms mean you can't grow food. Yeah. You know, the people move, all just making the connections, even just sort of like, we all have wheelie bins and we all recycle, but it's like we're stuck in this polytunnel of let's recycle and save the planet. Oh, but I forgot about the nuclear that's going to bomb us all. Just making those little connections, you know, stickers on your wheelie bin, stickers on your... Because the kids are really on board with the concept of the planet. You know, even the Pope talked about, it's about, we've got to look after our home, our earth, our well, planet. Even the Pope, the Pope in first of anybody. Yeah? yeah. Anyway, I'm not even more even the Pope, but this one, no. But you know, talking about the planet, yeah. getting people to think about caring for our planet, and then the people. And the nuclear question is just a no-brainer for the planet. Politicians and parents, and I'm a teacher, to introduce into school those links Climate change is coming on the agenda, not militarism, except in terms of having soldiers in school and promoting going yeah. to war. Um, and um, yeah, climate change, trident, um, and human rights. You probably remember that there were quite a lot of campaigns uh, which involved uh, direct action, and that was, um, and it basically was targeted at. American air bases. So um, that involved criminal damage and that was one quite effective way of getting a message across because it was quite unusual and the media, which is normally quite, um, well, not very receptive to the peace movement's message, actually found that quite interesting. Now, I'm asking you, do you think there's any scope for that type of direct action, criminal damage, non-violent, by the way, but criminal damage targeted at various sites now to get the message across because you, if you're asking the, the media for any favours, well, you won't, you won't find any favours from them. I think direct action is a plus and a minus. It depends what you do and when you do it. It's not just, I'm going to break the law and something will happen. You've got to do something that actually brings people with you. <laughs> He's five foot two and he's six feet four.
He fights with missiles and with spears He's all of 31 and he's only 17 He's been a soldier for a thousand years He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist, a Jain A Buddhist and a Baptist and a Jew And he knows he shouldn't kill And he knows he always will Kill you for me, my friend, and me for you And he's fighting for Canada He's fighting for France He's fighting for the USA And he's fighting for the Russians And he's fighting for Japan And he thinks we'll put an end to war this way And he's fighting for democracy He's fighting for the Reds He says it's for the peace of all He's the one who must decide Who's to live and who's to die And he never sees the writing on the wall He's the universal soldier And he really is to blame His orders come from far away no more They come from here and there And you and me And brothers, can't you see This is not the way we put the end to war